Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 23rd of July 2017. This is going to be quite a long one this week, so let's get straight on with the news. The Ubuntu 16.10, which was codenamed Yakti Yak, has reached the end of life on July the 20th. It was originally released on October the 13th, 2016, and as a non-long-term support release, it had a 9-month support cycle. So your upgrade route is to Ubuntu 17.04 which I very nearly installed today, but in the end decided to do a kernel upgrade instead, because it was quicker. From HelpNet Security, attackers are taking over NAS devices via SambaCry floor. Now I was thinking, I remember talking about this some time back, and yes, the code execution floor came in May. So why is it still a problem nowadays? Well, not really a problem for Linux desktops and servers, where the updates have been around for quite some time. Nope, NAS devices where firmware updates are not very prompt, and users are even less prompt at installing them. The SambaCry vulnerability, which is codenamed CVE 2017-7494, has been misused by attackers mostly to install cryptocurrency mining software on Linux servers. But in this latest campaign, most of the targets are NAS, or Network Attached Storage Devices, favoured by small to medium-sized businesses, and I would imagine home users as well. It is quite easy to find devices that use Samba in Shodan. Simply searching for port 445 with a Samba string will turn up a viable IP list. An attacker would then simply need to create a tool that can automatically write malicious files to every IP address on the list. Once they write the files into public folders, the devices with Samba Cry vulnerability could become infected. And its item of malware has been called Elf Shellbind A. The aim of the ELF Shellbind A Trojan is to establish communications with the attackers via a command and control server. It would grant them access to a compromised device and then provide them with an open command shell in the infected systems so they can issue any number of system commands and take control of the device. So it has not been mentioned what the attackers do with compromised devices. Stealing data and stealing logons, maybe lateral movement. I bet you those are the answers of what they've been doing. So what is the solution? Protect your device through the firewall and get any updates done. As mentioned in the article, it is more of an attack against NAS devices rather than Linux desktops and servers. From Fosbytes, Linux Windows macOS affected by 21-year-old Kerberos protocol bug. Patch now. Mm -hmm. If you're using Kerberos, that is. So a team of security researchers found a bug in the Kerberos network authentication protocol and they've named it Orpheus Lear. This flaw could be used by a man in the middle attacker to steal credentials and gain escalated privileges. And all affected platforms have received patches. So in the Kerberos protocol, there is an abundance of unauthenticated plain text, something which has been called cryptographic sin by the researchers. As a result, portions of the messages are neither encrypted nor integrity protected. To make sure the protocol remains secure, despite the wealth of unauthenticated plaintext, extreme care has been taken to authenticate the said plaintext. But in one instance, the ticket issued in the KDC responses could allow one to use a specific unauthenticated plaintext instead of an authenticated copy of the same text. This flaw is mitigated by the proper use of metadata in the KDC responses encrypted portion. However, due to the bug, that metadata could be taken from the unauthenticated plaintext. From Softpedia, after one and a half years of silence, the Netrunner rolling series makes a comeback today with the release of version 2017.07. It's based on Arch Linux and Manjaro operating systems, and from what I remember, it uses the KDE Plasma desktop. So it's been 16 months since the last update. And the good news is that it's here to stay and will receive regular three or four times a year updates. So the highlights of this latest release are that it includes a KDE Plasma 5.10.3 desktop environment along with KDE applications 17.04.2 and it's all built against the Qt 5.9 application framework. Under the hood it's powered by the kernel 4.11.8. The thing I always liked about Netrunner is that it was a very pretty distribution. The couple of screenshots there, yeah. It's something a little bit more unique for KDE. Another article from Softpedia. Ubuntu 16.04 long-term support users can now install the Linux kernel 4.10 from Ubuntu 17.04. So this is the hardware enablement stack. 
Now the great thing about the hardware enablements now in Ubuntu is that if you've added it, you don't have to mess around uninstalling the older, unsupported distributions, it will automatically upgrade to the newer kernel. Unlike Ubuntu 14.04, yeah, that required a bit of messing around when the kernel came end of life. And we can expect to see the Ubuntu 16.04.3 long-term support launching on 3rd of August with the kernel 4.10. There's been a new release of KDE Plasma 5.10.4. There's nothing too special in this release, it's mostly bug fixes and translation updates. I know it's already been released in KDE Neon, and as for Kubuntu backport, I think that might be a little bit behind and we'll gain this update in the next few days. A blog post update from Krita that they've released version 3.2 beta 1. And there's mention here about some new series of brushes that have been added, and they've been used to create some rather beautiful artwork here. Well, that almost looks like it was painted on canvas, and that's quite impressive for digital art. From OMG Ubuntu, the GNOME Tweak tool has been renamed. So now it is just called GNOME Tweak, and the GNOME team have also renamed some of their other applications by dropping the GNOME prefix. So GNOME Web is just web, and GNOME Photos is just photos. So it's just purely a branding change, GNOME Tweaks is still the same app as before. It is unlikely that those who launch the app from muscle memory, super key, T, W and E keys, result, smack on enter, will be affected by the name change. Fair point, yep, it's still got tweak in the name, so no difference there on the application searcher. Oh, a bit of a teaser post here from Martin Wimpress on the Ubuntu Mate development. How many words does an animated picture paint? So this is an update on the development of the heads up display. Looks very nice now. Yeah, because that feature wasn't quite working in the previous release of Ubuntu Mate. What would that be? 17.04. So is this something we can expect for 17.10? Well, I certainly hope so. From linuxconfig.org, monitor AMD Ryzen temperatures in Linux with the latest kernel modules. Ooh, great. This is a feature that I've been lacking at the moment, and even though I'm up to the latest kernel on the 4.12 series, what was it, 4.12.3 or 4? Oh, I've just checked, it was kernel 4.12.3, which I've just installed. And at the moment, for me, the temperature modules do not work. So here's some instructions. Uh, it's quite a bit to do, really. There are two modules you'll encounter on Ryzen boards. They are the IT87 and the NCT6775. Just about every board has one or the other. IT87 is more common. So depending on what you have, you can get the code from this GitHub repository, which has been created by Groek. So yeah, it's quite a bit to do, but if you've got a Ryzen board, you might want to try this out. From Tech Republic, a $25 Raspberry Pi Challenger is faster and runs Android Nougat and supports 4K video. Lipotato is yet another board that appears to outstrip the Pi 3's performance. Lepotato, honestly, what a weird name. Like a chip off the old block, isn't it? So Lepotato's video capabilities go beyond the $35 Raspberry Pi 3 Model B and its 1080 video playback, with Lepotato supporting 4K 60 frames a second video playback and HDR10 via HDMI 2. So it has a quad core ARM Cortex A53 based AM Logic S905X system on a chip and is clocked at 1.5 GHz. According to Libra Computer, it's 50% faster than the quad-core 1.2 GHz A53 based Broadcom chip in the Pi 3. So the potato board will run Android Nougat 7.1, and Libra Computer claims it has a better general performance in Android than the Pi 3, listing a Geekbench multi-core benchmark score of 1902 for the potato versus 1302 for the Pi. So while the $25 Lepotato board has 1 gig of memory, the computer is available with double the RAM, with a 2 gigabyte version selling for $39 or $35 for early backers. A $65 version of the computer will include an active cooling case with a heatsink. Whoa, the price has just jumped up considerably now. And there is the option for other operating systems, including Ubuntu 16.04 and Debian 9. So the potato has currently raised about 14500 towards its $25,000 goal. And there is a picture of the prototype version. Looks very nice. Another article from OMG Ubuntu, Firefox market share is falling off a cliff, says former Mozilla CTO. 
Why is Firefox losing the browser wars? Rise of mobile and dominance of Chrome. Yeah. To be fair, Firefox did an awful lot in the browser wars. It started pushing back against Internet Explorer, and it forced Microsoft to go back into developing it. Their dominance was so complete by Internet Explorer 6 that they pretty much disbanded the team, which was why it was quite a long time before Internet Explorer 7 came about. But by then, Firefox had made quite good inroads on browser usage. So Firefox is still used by a huge number of people and is still about 90 million users. But because it's open source, it can never truly die. Yeah, fair point. Ubuntu wants to know what apps you think should be included by default in the next long-term support release of Ubuntu 18.04. You can suggest multiple apps for each category. You can suggest a non-free and non-open source software, but you must note in your list. What, can't they work it out themselves? So there's a few different categories you can choose from. What should we say? Web browser, Firefox, got to recuperate their numbers. Email client, don't know, don't use one. Terminal, console, IDE. KDE Desktop, Dolphin File Manager, Kate Text Editor, IRC, wouldn't include it, PDF Viewer, um, was it Ocular, Office Suite, LibreOffice, Calendar, don't know, whatever the default is, Video Player, VLC, Video Editor, wouldn't include it, Music Player, Clementine, Photo Viewer, Gwenview, Photo Editor, wouldn't include it, Screen Recorder, definitely not. Oh wait, I've just built Kubuntu now, haven't I? <laughs> anyway, so I did have a couple of options for the stupid news of the week. I was tempted with this one until I found one article slightly better. But here it is, though. So, woman had no idea she had 27 contact lenses stuck to her eye. Ouch. A 67-year-old woman scheduled for cataract surgery discovered she had 27 contact lenses stuck to her eye. A hard mass that appeared to be a bluish foreign body was removed from the woman's eye by surgeons, who learnt it was really 17 lenses fused together by mucus. Doctors used a microscope and found another 10 lenses in her eye. And she'd worn disposable lenses for 35 years and didn't regularly visit the opticians. She chalked up her discomfort to old age and dry eye. <laughs> Honestly, how can you not have noticed? But anyway, the stupid news for the week from the register. Money supermarket fined £80,000 for spamming 7 million customers. Go compare, worry. Yeah, go compare the original opt out request, firm told. <laughs> so, price comparison website Money Supermarket has been fined £80,000 for sending 7.1 million emails to customers who had opted out of receiving direct marketing emails. The message was audaciously dressed up as an invitation asking people to accept promo material. Folks who had previously insisted they'd rather not be on the receiving end of marketing bump were asked if they'd like to reconsider. The missive read, we hold an email address for you, which means we could be sending you personalised news, products and promotions. You've told us in the past you prefer not to receive these. If you'd like to reconsider, simply click the following link. <laughs> yeah, good one. In a move that anyone apart from it seems money supermarket should have predicted, customers weren't pleased, and one reported it to the information commissioner's office. On investigation, the ICO said that MoneySupermarket.com had broken the privacy and electronic communication regulations and slapped it with an £80,000 fine. In a statement, they said, Organisations can't get around the law by sending direct marketing dressed up as legitimate updates. When people opt out of direct marketing, organisations must stop sending it. No questions asked. Until such a time the customer gives their consent. They don't get a chance to persuade people to change their minds. Nice one. Well, that was a week of Linux news. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later. <laughs>